In this video, we're going to be going over section number three of the Linux walkthrough series on TriHackMe, and that's also part of the pre-security path. So with that, we're going to dive right in. First, if you're following along on TriHackMe, be sure to launch this system and you might need to connect to it via SSH. But be sure to follow along if you're watching this video and you want to get some practice because there are practical exercises along the way that can be a great way to test your knowledge. To this point, we've learned a lot about how to interact with and navigate through the file system. But let's say you want to edit something in side of a document and you want to edit basically the contents. That's where text editors come in in the terminal. Now there's a number of different types of text editors on Linux, but the two main ones that you'll find most people use is Nano or Vim. Personally, I'm a Nano guy and a lot of you watching this video might judge me for it and that's fine. Leave me a comment about that. A lot of people say that they use Vim, but no one's seen them because they haven't figured out how to exit Vim. Leave a comment down below if you have managed to exit Vim because that's that's important. We need to know that people have survived. But in reality, both are very solid text editors. Vim requires a little bit more of a commitment to memory. Nano displays a lot of the key, key bindings down at the bottom of the screen, but both are very good to use. So there's really not much of a difference in either case. But to be able to use either one, you can type nano and then the name of the file or vi in the name of the file. Now say there's something that you don't yet have on your, on your system and you want to get it, you want to download it. You can use the wget command and then a link to the file online that you want to download. This might require some pseudo permissions depending on what your what level you're using this as, but that's basically the command. Now say you want to be able to copy a file over to another host over SSH. You can use the SCP or the secure copy command. And here on TryHackMe, you can see how exactly you can craft a secure copy command. And basically goes SCP, the name of the file that you want to copy over, the user of the remote system, at the IP address of that system colon and then the path to where you want to store this system. Now say you want to copy something over from a remote system you can do basically the same thing but you can do SCP and then that whole long line about user IP and then path and then the name of the file as you would like it to be saved on your system. So basically if you're sending it out you're going to include the name of the file that you're sending first and then if you're copying it over you're going to include the name of the file that you want it to be saved as last. Now, sometimes you might want to host your own web server on Python so that way you can retrieve it from other machines as well. You can use Python for that. So for instance, you can use python 3 m HTTP.server, and then that will open up an HTTP server and it will open up a server uh, on the default port 80 port on your machine. Now mind you, it will do this in the file system that you are hosting the server on. So it might be helpful to create a dedicated folder to run this server and then make sure that only the files and stuff that you need people to access is in that folder and nothing more. Let's get into processes. And this is where things get a little confusing for me, but it's okay, we're all on this together. Every operating system has a number of automated processes that are running 24 7 most of those are just the random chores that your operating system needs to execute just to run. And they're fairly innocuous. But sometimes there might be processes that you do want to kill because either they're taking up too much CPU or they might be malicious. Now each process is given a unique identifier or a PID, a process identifier. And that's basically how you can make determinations on if you want to kill it or not is using the PID and then you just know which process to kill. So if you type PS in, then you will see a list of processes processes and that shows the list of processes running under your account but if you want to see all the processes running on the operating system type in PSAUX or PSOX and that will show you all the processes running on your machine as well as who owns each process. You're going to see a lot of processes owned by root and that's fine as long as like they're not malicious so you do probably need to know about the common process. Another command you can use is the top command and it will show you the top processes that are being run on your system. Now say you see a process that you don't like. You can type the kill and then PID of whatever it is that you want to kill and it will kill that process for you. Now there's a lot of times that you'll want to create a process or create an application or something like that that you want to be able to start as soon as you start your system. And so that's where you can use the system control command to be able to tell your system that as soon as you boot up I want the system running. For instance let's say you want to run an Apache server and it has the example here on TryHackMe but run system control or system C CTL start Apache 2 and optionally if you want to stop it you can type system CTL stop or say you want to restart system CTL restart. There's also enable and disable and enable and disable basically toggle whether or not that will start up or 
not startup on system boot. Now you might have a lot of tasks that you want to run automatically and that's where Crontab comes in. Crontab is pretty, pretty cool. And it basically, it allows you to schedule specifically when and, and what frequency you want different command line commands to be run on your system. And it is incredibly easy to use. You literally just front load the command with the time frequency and then you put the command that you want to run at the end. It's that easy, it's so awesome. And you can literally edit Crontab anytime by typing in Crontab-E and it will show you all the different cron jobs and you can edit it from there. Next, let's talk about repositories. And this is a great topic to talk about, especially if you wanna make sure that your operating system has the functionality that you're looking for. And that's where the apt command comes in. For instance, the command add-apt-repository and then the name of the repository that you're wanting to add, that really is something that you can use. Now, Try Hack Me goes through a lot of the detail here and how exactly you can add repositories but I think it's very important to understand that keys are important and being able to have the correct key will really make or break how you can get the repository added after all you want to make sure that you can trust wherever you're downloading from once you have the key downloaded you want to make sure that you have it added to your trusted list so that way your machine knows that it's trusted and then from there you'll be able to download the repository itself another important command that you should know of is is apt-get update and apt-get upgrade and those will basically update and upgrade all of your repositories to make sure that you're running their most recent version on everything next let's talk about system logs and everything's going to be stored for the most part unless you specify otherwise or in slash far slash log this is an important place especially if you're working with logs for your job you'll want to be able to know where these logs are so you can ingest them into something like a sim or any kind of other program that you're using to be able to work with these logs and identify any kind of issues that need to be found in these logs. Another command, if you're not using one of those tools while working with these logs is grep. Open the log, grep for something interesting, and maybe you'll find it, maybe you won't. But really, for the most part, the amount of data that appears in var log is, it, it really balloons very quickly. And that's where a sim can be really, really helpful. And that's part three of Linux. So by now, you should be fairly familiar with the Linux operating system. On this video, we kick off Windows. And that's another three-part series that you should be familiar with. We're finishing up the the Try Hack Me pre-security pathway and this is a playlist of all those videos up to this point. So you should try it out. It's nice. With that, we'll see you all next time. Bye.